Welcome to A Reason for Hope, your question connection with the entire Word of God. We would love for you to join in our conversation. Simply follow us on our Facebook page at Calvary Christian Fellowship of Tucson. If you have a question, email or text us at questionsforhope at gmail.com. Now here's your host, pastor, author, and Bible teacher, Scott Richards, along with his right-hand man, Sean Richards. Well, welcome to another edition of A Reason for Hope, your question connection with the entire Word of God. We mean that quite literally. Any question you have about the Bible all the way from Genesis to Revelation on the table here in the next few moments as uh, we talk about things that really matter, issues that are going to impact your life, not only in the here and now, but the hereafter as revealed in God's divinely inspired Word, the Bible. As you heard in our introduction, if you would like to join us, uh, you can do that in our primary source that's located uh, still on Facebook. Uh, we're crossing our fingers but uh, that is available for you at Calvary Christian Fellowship of Tucson you can log on in and uh, be a part of our conversation get your questions to us in our famous comment corner and we can answer them in real time it's so exciting to see how we can reach out quite literally all around the world through that platform and we will continue to do so as long as uh, we are uh, able log on in and get those uh, questions rolling in the comment corner we'll be happy to take them in real time as you send them on in one 556 1212 our toll-free number anywhere across the 50 states you can get a question to us through our google phone app they'll ask you uh, who you want to leave the message for just say uh, questions for hope or a reason for hope and then uh, fire away through text-to-speech we'll be able to answer those questions as well uh, nearly in uh, real time as they come on in Questions for hope at gmail.com, our email address. We monitor that through the program as well. So if you'd like to get us a question there, uh, you can get those questions to us and be part of the conversation if, uh, for whatever reason, you are not uh, logged in on Facebook. So uh, without any uh, further ado, we're looking forward to jumping on in and exploring uh, not only the events of the day, the events of tomorrow through biblical prophecy, tough questions, uh, personal is issues in your walk with God, Anything you'd like to discuss, uh, anything that's on your heart and your mind, we are going to tackle. So before we go any further, uh, how about if uh, we uh, speak to the most honored guest we have here each and every day, uh, our Lord, would you like to pray for us, Sean? Be an honor. Dad, thank you that we have the chance to share your word. We pray that we would not only receive your heart, but have not only enough, but the overflow of being able to share with your people. Equip us for every good work, and thank you that we have the honor of sharing your word freely. Continue to enable us to do so as you see fit, and enable us even now to do so in a way that honors you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, uh, starting us off, a question from John, who wants to know, uh, three questions actually. First is, who is the audience for James' letter? We'll start with that and then build on it, assuming that the question won't be answered along the way. Yeah, uh, you know, a lot of people will uh, ask that question. As you look at the introduction uh, of the book of James, the uh, opening lines identify the readers of James as the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad. Uh, so there are those who will say that this letter was very specifically written to uh, all Jewish people who are outside of uh, the Roman territory of Palestine at that time. And he wouldn't have been scattered uh, to the four winds through Jewish history, and that would include both Christian and uh, non-Christian Jews. I, I think that's unlikely since uh, James identifies himself as uh, Christ, and there are a number of passages where he uh, targets the people he's speaking to uh, as believers in the Lord. Uh, some people believe that it is a figurative reference to all Christian churches and uh, those who buy into what we would call replacement theology that says that uh, God is done with Israel, no longer has a plan for Israel. Uh, they would uh, point to the last uh, verses of uh, the book of Galatians that say, uh, peace to all those who live by this rule, even the Israel of God. Uh, and they'd say, well, all uh, Israel means is governed by God, so anyone who's governed by God is in view there. So uh, not really talking about Jews specifically, but uh, about the church. Well, you know, I, I think that's really uh, improbable because there are uh, very strong elements within the letter of James that have uh, decidedly Jewish elements. So, you know, the most likely view of who is being addressed here are Jewish Christians 
of the same variety that we meet in Acts chapter 2. You might recall at the day of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit was poured forth, uh, there was quite a reaction from those that were uh, in attendance. Uh, we are told that uh, after the disciples uh, received uh, the power to be able to speak in languages, uh, they never learned. We are told that uh, the crowd that gathered were amazed and marveled and said, look, are not all those who speak Galileans? How is it that we hear each in our own language in which we were born, Parthians and Medes and Elamites, those dwelling in Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya joining Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs. We hear them speaking in our own tongues the wonderful works of God. So quite literally you had uh, pretty much a, a wide circle of uh, individuals that were scattered abroad who were not living in Israel at that time. And, and that would tend to make sense especially the reference to the Parthians, because uh, most of the Jews that were scattered uh, in the Babylonian uh, exile never returned. Uh, they simply settled down in their new uh, nation, which at first was the Babylonian Empire, then became the Medo-Persian Empire, and finally at the time of the writing of uh, Acts, it was the Parthian Empire. So uh, you had all kinds of people who were scattered all around outside of Israel who were Jews. The, the term that is used there is the diaspora, the scattering uh, of the Jews. And so James, uh, identified as the half-brother of Jesus, and a very prominent individual in the church at Jerusalem, uh, would uh, write this letter to uh, those who didn't have the direct benefit of sitting under the apostles' teaching in Jerusalem and in the environs of Israel itself. It was designed to minister to people, probably those same people that were there at Pentecost, who had received the Lord, who had heard the message of Christ, needed some discipling because they had returned to their own homes. They couldn't sit under the apostles' teaching on a consistent basis. So that's probably who the uh, target audience is. makes the most sense. All right. So then with that in mind, James says, this is continuing on with the question, that he is a servant of Jesus and he writes to the 12 tribes. He calls them brethren. So were these Hebrew brethren, believers or scattered unbelievers who are Hebrew quote-unquote brothers scattered where? As was mentioned, the Roman Empire and all the provinces in which the Jews had been dispersed throughout the ages. Now, this can go, again, as we mentioned, back into history quite a ways, but this common audience that he was speaking to were to believers, which is also what ties into the next part of this question. Uh, unless this is an op-ed in the New York Times, we are just hoping that your audience finds your letter. To add difficulty, the 12 tribes are in Jerusalem, according to Acts, not necessarily. Uh, Martin Luther said that James wasn't for Christians. What uh, may or may not be relevant is that James is the only New Testament author who does not give the gospel. He's confused by this. Well, regarding that third question, let's uh, just try and be consistent here. Is the Old Covenant, is the Ten Commandments or the Law of Moses reiterated or detailed in every book of the Old Testament? No. No, so that would be a very inconsistent approach to a right relationship with God or what belongs in the canon. When they judged what belonged in the Bible or didn't, they looked at the author, they looked at the God they were speaking about, and the substance of their writing. Not that it doesn't mention this or that. I had a debate recently where uh, someone uh, pointed out that Paul doesn't mention the Trinity explicitly. And I said, yeah, because he was talking about other things. If you want the nature of God, notice I spent the whole time quoting the Old Testament. Yeah. But if we're talking about this issue, issue of saying, why is James in our Bible in the first place if its audience is exclusively Jewish? Well, as I recall in Acts chapter, I believe, 19, James himself gave full support, two thumbs up to Paul and Barnabas in going and reaching out to the Gentiles, the non-Jewish people, did he not? Yeah, and it, again, Acts 15, the Jerusalem Council, uh, was, was where that happened in uh, the book of Galatians chapter 2. Uh, the Apostle Paul in chapters 1 and 2 uh, talks about uh, Paul coming back to uh, Jerusalem, to James, he mentions, and John and Peter and the others, these notable individuals. And he said they added nothing to the message that we were preaching. So, you know, the, the gospel that Paul was sharing was certainly the uh, gospel that was uh, being uh, shared at Jerusalem. You know, the, uh, the notion that this is the only New Testament book where the gospel isn't explicitly preached uh, you'd be hard-pressed to find the gospel, for instance, in the book of Third John. Uh, you would uh, be hard-pressed to find 
an explicit statement of uh, how to get saved in the book of Philemon. Uh, these were uh, very uh, personalized letters that were preserved that obviously have uh, principles that we want to apply across the board. But to say that, to make that claim that uh, James was the only one that did this uh, just doesn't hold water. You could even make the case that James' explicit uh, uh, conversation about uh, what real faith and justification by faith is all about uh, would be a preaching of the gospel, much like you would see it in the book of Romans. But uh, having said that, uh, there are those like Martin Luther. Martin Luther viewed the book of James as he called it the epistle of straw. That was his famous quote. He didn't really believe that it should be uh, in the Bible, but as we discover from history, Martin Luther uh, started out, I think, with a very uh, uh, New Testament-oriented perspective towards Jewish people. But the more resistant uh, he found Jewish communities to his preaching, the harder-hearted he got and uh, got to the point where he was almost virulently anti-Semitic at uh, the end of his life, so much so that Adolf Hitler quoted him favorably as far as his uh, point of view on the Jewish people. So I'm not really sure I would look at Luther as a great uh, barometer as to uh, the legitimacy of the writing of James. But why would James then write to this exclusively Jewish audience? Why, why wasn't he more broad in terms of what he was saying if we as believers who are non-Jewish are to apply the principles we find there in our lives? Well, I think part of the answer can go into Paul's point about you were grafted in as wild olive branches, that you are a part of the family of faith, and noting that we share in that common relationship with God through the covenant of Abraham, that you trust God's promises, and he considers that grounds for adoption. Yeah. He's made it so simple, even we can't mess it up. And by the way, James quotes that passage, but that's an aside. When we're talking about the issue, though, of, okay, if James is speaking to Jews, and it's in our Bibles, but we're not Jews, does this mean this is a book that we skip? Well, no more than we would want to avoid the Old Testament. Why? Because as Paul himself stated in Romans chapter 2, what advantage then has the Jew? Much in every way, because it was given to them to be the oracles of God. They were the first-hand messengers and spokesmen right. for the word of God to the entire world. So if, and this is going all the way back to Deuteronomy, by the way, they were to be a witness to all nations of what a nation led after God, not the United States, is Israel would look like that was meant to be something they would export, not isolate themselves right. with. Right. So if James is speaking to Jews, essentially this is the same grounds we would take the book of Hebrews with and saying that, okay, we've got some heavy Old Testament background here and by golly, an Old Testament style, by the way. He uh, essentially could be called the book of Proverbs in the New Testament right. because it's all about practicality, not just what you believe, but what you do with it. So if all of these principles are being laid out by someone who was A, an apostle, B is for a first hand eyewitness, and C, one of the members of the early church who would qualify as such as not only an important witness of his resurrection, but actually, believe it or not, one of the hostile witnesses historically people look for and say I'm having a hard time here denying the resurrection because his little brother admitted that he rose Older from brother, the dead yeah, yeah, well yeah. Uh, in relation to Jesus James would be the little brother yeah. but noting that point yeah. he's saying okay uh, what would it take for you to believe that if um, uh, my uncle, your brother Rick, started claiming that he was God, what, what resurrection from the dead would be a start. That, and that, it, that would be a big one, yeah. And would, for you to admit to that would be on the same grounds as James, belie James believing that his older brother right. Joshua right. was who he said he was. So it's an important case for history, not something that we should dismiss. It's consistent with everything we read in the Old Testament and New as far as the character of God. It shouldn't be thrown out. And third, it comes from someone who is there to affirm everything that he saw. If, again, Martin Luther's prejudices come from heart experience, full sympathies, but bitterness isn't an excuse in of anything, let alone itself. Secondly, or I guess, well, how many numbers am I on now? Fiftly, when we're talking <laughs> about you're, the issue. If you're keeping score at home. When we're talking about the issue of, so why should I take James into consideration as among all other books in the Bible, one that I should pay very careful attention to, well, because it's not only one of the books that was quoted by the early church fathers, they thought it was legitimate, but he actually carried more weight and authority in the church than the Apostle Peter. It was him they deferred authority to in the Council of Jerusalem. Yeah, in Acts 15, yeah. So when we're talking about this issue, who are the ones with direct connection to the most 
the most, I guess, first-hand reliable information historically about God. We would mention the Apostles, the Twelve, James, who's mentioned in 1 Corinthians 15 as well, and, of course, the 500. Now, when we're talking about who was the one who was the most influenced in the early church, that doesn't go to the Apostles, that goes to James. Right. Because he didn't just see Jesus for three years, he saw the full 33, yeah. or I guess uh, however long it took for him to show up on the world scene, minus his birth. Third, when we're talking about who was the one who put forward this information, once again, every single early church father that bore testimony to the Apostle James, or the Epistle of James, rather, said this was from the Apostle James. So we have no reason to doubt it. When it comes to his audience, though, remember that when a Jew is speaking to fellow Jews, they're talking about the same God that we believe in. Yeah. And it would be no more reason to throw it out than if a scholar speaking to fellow scholars is giving information that's on our test. Yeah, and uh, the other thing that uh, that throws people a little bit is, okay, well, why this uh, you know this narrow uh, categorization of uh, referring to uh, these these individuals, the twelve tribes which are scattered uh, abroad? Well, you need to understand something else about the context in which the book of James was written. Uh, prior to uh, the first foray into those who those in Jerusalem would consider to be half-breed Jews, the Samaritans, uh, the early church was 100% Jewish. It wasn't until the Lord uh, had to drag Simon Peter kicking and screaming to share the gospel with Cornelius, the Roman centurion, that any Gentiles were part were considered part of the early church and so the early church was looked upon as almost exclusively jewish just because that was the nature of it uh from this uh, most people believe that james is one of the earliest letters that is uh, written uh across the board and because it was written so early we know that james was martyred uh no later than 60 a.d at the latest um, probably earlier than that uh, many scholars will place the writing of the book of james roughly around 45 uh, A.D. or, or uh, probably about uh, 12 years or so since the time that Jesus rose from the dead. So a very, very early letter. It was a letter that was detailing the conditions that were apparent there in the church. The other thing that, uh, that I think really uh, interestingly uh, comes out in all of this is uh, that, uh, that when we take a look at, uh, you know, how uh, James wrote and so on, you know, it was not just because it was going uh, out to a uh, Jewish audience because most of the believers there uh, were Jews. But, uh, you know, even beyond its, you know, addressing here, there's a there's a uh, flexibility as far as the address goes. It was considered to be a circular letter, uh, you know, hence the uh, reference to, well, was it just like an op-ed in the New York Times? Well, no, it wasn't op-ed. It was uh, something that was intended, uh, much like we see with uh, Paul's letter to the Ephesians, how he gives instructions that this letter would uh, not only be read at the church at Ephesus, but also shared with the church at Laodicea. And the church at Laodicea, which had received a letter from Paul, was to share their letter back with the church at Ephesus. Uh, you know, if you really want to get picky about things, you know, you could take a look at every uh, epistle that we find in the New Testament and say, well, wait a minute, it says this is addressed to the church at Corinth, so I guess it's just written to Greeks who lived in the city of Corinth, so it has nothing to say to me. Well, it obviously has some very specific things to say about specific conditions that were going on at the church of Corinth, for instance, uh, that might not be germane to what we're dealing with. Uh, most of us don't have a temple of Aphrodite next door to our church, but uh, it does contain timeless principles that we can apply to the life of the church. 1 Corinthians 13, I think, would be a shining example of that. We can't just say, well, we don't need to pay attention to that because that was just written for the Corinthians. Uh, you know, when people start going down that path, probably need to, you know, mix in a little decaf and uh, relax a little bit and uh, allow uh, the scripture to speak, you know, on its own merits. When you read through the book of James, do we see anything that's not taught anywhere else in the New Testament? No, it's all reiterated in different ways and different formats in other parts of the New Testament. Does it have a unique contribution to make? Yeah, certainly it does uh, by nuance and the way it's expressed. Is it taken but, out of context by cult groups? Yes, but that's true of any verse. Yeah, so uh, so that's that, that I think is the important things that we need to understand about that. And it gets into uh, a, another question, uh, you know, that we should touch upon real briefly because this really is kind of the root of the issue. 
Um, why are some books of the Bible considered divinely inspired, like James, and some other books, like, say, The Shepherd of Hermas or The Letters of Clement, uh, not considered inspired? Well, first of all, because if someone writes a book, that doesn't necessarily mean that it's from God. It could just be from that person. Secondly, if someone writes a book about God, that doesn't necessarily mean it's from right. God. The author can just be writing their perspective. When we're talking about the Bible, we're talking about a book that's been recognized not just by us, but by Christians throughout the centuries as one of revelation rather than speculation, as we like to say. Now, if God's going to reveal himself to us, then much like a signature on someone else's letter. Paul himself uh, made personal attempts to clarify that. I'll sign this with my own hand. How do we recognize God's handwriting? Well, first of all, it's going to be in line with his character. It's going to be talking about the same God consistently. It's not going to be bound by space or borders. And of course, it's going to be proven not just by words but by deeds. This is the standard that was laid out going all the way back to the time of Moses, the first guy God used to speak to mankind through writing. Now with the Bible being introduced with Genesis through Deuteronomy, those were Moses' writings. What standard did that give us going forward? Well first of all, if God's going to speak, he's going to, as we said, back up words with deeds. If anyone claimed to be a prophet, they would have to put their money where their mouth was. And if their mouth was coming from God, he'd be able to perhaps forward a little bit of cash to keep with the illustration. When miracles were done in the name of God, it was meant to verify his words, which is why every time you see miracles happening, often in spurts, if you notice the trend in Jewish history, it was always intended to verify the message that was being spoken, going all the way from the Pharaoh of Egypt and the people of Israel to Pentecost and the people that were listening there. Right. They weren't performing miracles because of inadequate medical technology. Those healings were meant and understood to be, this is why you listen to these guys. Yeah. It's the same thing for Paul being uh, healed from the snake, for example. It wasn't because, oh, I guess I have to fill in the gap here because anti-venom hasn't been invented yet. No, God did that so that the people on that island would listen to what he had to say about him. So if that is then the standard going forward, what else could we test in the substance and writing? Because even Deuteronomy says that people can perform signs and wonders in the name of other gods. So how do you know you're not being basically bamboozled by a charlatan or a deceiver. Well, first of all, they have to be talking about the same God. God's not going to change, not in his actions or in his uh, personhood, his but essence, in, yeah. in his nature. It's yeah. that he's going to continue to be good. He's going to be consistent with his standards for what is right and what is wrong. And most importantly, while the execution may change with time and setting, the purpose behind them won't. If someone goes to contradict God on his basis, you know you're dealing with a false prophet. If someone goes out of their way to make a passage unclear in order to establish a doctrine, then you know you're dealing with a false prophet. If someone is putting forward information about God that is in conflict with everything he said thus far, that he's just one God among many, for example, or you can become a God one day, that is a false prophet because it conflicts with what else God has said. There is no God before me, there will be none after me, I know not one, for example. So if that is then the standard or the bar going forward as well, what do we expect apart from miracles and consistency? We need accuracy. Is the information in the books not only correct <laughs> in its observations about the past, but relevant to the present and also accurate in regards to the future? Because God doesn't make mistakes. Yeah, and it's also, excuse me, tying into the miracle aspect of that. Predictions of the future would tie into it. But noting that if one of those prophecies were to fail, notice, not, not fulfilled yet, but failed, then it would be disqualified, and the individual who claimed it would be under a capital offense, according to the theocracy of Israel. And then finally, not only do you need miracles, you need uh, accuracy, you need accountability, but most importantly, you need, uh, or excuse me, accuracy, you will have accountability. The people who would claim to be speaking in the name of God would be taking their lives into their hands, given the entire swath of 1,500 years of Jewish history when they finalized the last book. The Jews were more than willing to execute John if he claimed to some, uh, 
claimed something that was in the name of God but wasn't. Now note, when they started reading these books, it's like, oh, we don't have a book about a seven-headed dragon in here. Why don't we throw that in? No, it had to come from someone who was an eyewitness. John had been verified by miracles. He was a reputable <laughs> source on these sort of things. But most importantly, God had affirmed him not just through words but with deeds, and none of the information conflicted with anything in Scripture. In fact, almost 75% of the book is just spent quoting the Old Testament anyway. Right. So note that point. When we consider what is in our Bible and what aren't, we're looking for those things. Did the author claim to be a prophet? Did he pass the test of a prophet? Is the test of the prophet determined by Moses or something else that they made up on the fly? Or, when it's ultimately said and done, when it is quoted throughout history, are these the sort of things that are referenced and quoted by the people who knew the ones who were writing it in yeah. the first place. Yeah. Yeah. The Shepherd of Hermas wasn't quoted as verifiable doctrine. It was circulated as a good writing, but that's no more relevant to my walk with God than, say, Charlotte's Web or Tales of Huckleberry Finn. It is a classic book of literature, but it's not from God. Why? The author never said it was. The information in it doesn't suggest it is. And, of course, if there was any presentation of God, which there isn't, then, of course, it would have to be tested with other revelation. So that's why all those uh, James is in our Bible and the Shepherd of Hermas would not be. Yeah, yeah, and uh, you know, it is a question that does come up when the Da Vinci Code and all that other uh, sort of nonsense gets uh, bandied about that somehow there were uh, uh, forbidden books of the Bible or there were books of the Bible that were just as valid as the uh, Gospels, but uh, they were suppressed by the evil Constantine and, and so on. Uh, nothing had been further from the truth. Uh, when it comes to the New Testament, there's two ways to look at it. And another important thing to understand some people will look at the New Testament and say it's an authoritative collection of books. In other words, they will look at, say, the church councils and say the reason that these things are in our Bibles today is because this authoritative group said these are the books that are divinely inspired. So it all stands but, or falls on those people. But it, it, the, the, best, the better way to look at it and the historically consistent way to look at it is not that a group of individuals said these are the authoritative groups or books that we've grouped together and we think that these are the ones that are right on, but rather the, it's a collection of authoritative books that individuals recognized. I guess just to sum it up, I, I mean, I really loved uh, the line from the uh, great biblical scholar J.I. Packer. He said, the church no more gave us uh, the New Testament than Sir Isaac Newton gave us the law of gravity. Uh, they simply recognized what God had already done. And so when we take a look at uh, books like the book of James that was controversial in some settings, uh, you know, we see that it does pass that test of uh, the highfalutin term is canonicity. The word canon isn't referring to something you shoot cannonballs out of. It's a Greek word that literally meant a measuring stick, a, a way of evaluating whether something was true. And Sean, you did a great job of uh, laying out why we believe the New Testament books and the Old Testament books are true. Good, so I don't have to get killed with rocks either. Yeah. Um, here's a question we received from uh, Pam, who wants to know, is there an outreach of any kind on Davis Monthan? For those listening internationally. That's the Air Force Base here. Yeah. yeah. Um, as far as a outreach to the Air Force Base, I don't know if that's what you're asking, no. But when it comes to a nearby fellowship or a good church location, that wouldn't be too much of a stretch. I know our campus would be a bit of a drive from there. Uh, I'd recommend Calvary Chapel's West Campus. Um, Julian Drive is the location. Palo Verde and I-10. Yeah, yeah, you can find that on the uh, Calvary you Chapel. You could walk from Davis Month in there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But that would be the one uh, closest to you and note as well, uh, Robert Furrow is a very close friend, trusted resource, and a solid Bible teacher. So if you want to, uh, uh, the individuals you mentioned, uh, to bring them there, then I think that would be their greatest source of edification. Their hours are uh, basically the same as ours at CCF, it would be Monday, or not Mondays, uh, Sundays. Yeah, just go to CalvaryTucson.com. You can get all the information there. Yeah, and they'll have the hours for yep. you as well. Calvary yep. Tucson, CalvaryChapel.com. So, yep. uh, thank you for the question, Pam. Um, also noting that point, we have another question. From uh, John, it's a follow-up on James, uh, by the way, and a really uh, very popular section of the book of James. John uh, writes more uh, of James. In James chapter 1 and verse 5, he speaks about asking for wisdom. Can you please explain how and without reproach fits into the perspective of this verse? Thanks. Well, thank you, John, for a great question. Uh, you know, I love this passage in James, and I can't tell you how many times 
uh, I've shared it with people that uh, feel like they're clueless about whether uh, what whether and what God's will is for their lives. Uh, in fact, if I had a dime for every time I've been asked in ministry, how can I know God's perfect will for my life? I'd be a wealthy man right now. Well, James chapter 1, uh, beginning at verse 5, I think is a great place to go. It says, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith with no doubting, for he who doubts is like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. For let not that man suppose he will receive anything from the Lord, for he's a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. Now, I, I love this because what it says is this. You know, when it comes to the guidance of God, God is far more interested in guiding us than we are in being guided. Uh, he is all over uh, the idea of us coming to him and asking him for wisdom. Now, wisdom is opposed just to head knowledge. Wisdom is knowing not just uh, facts about God, but what to do with those facts. It's not just knowing uh, things that might apply to a particular situation. It's knowing how to apply those truths that we find in the Bible to a particular situation. That's what wisdom is. It's, it's the knowledge of God in shoe leather, it's been called before. And so if you lack wisdom, you know, you're in a place where, man, I'm clueless. What am I supposed to do? How can I make the next step and be right with God? First, let him ask of God. This is probably where we get hung up more than any other. Uh, because sometimes uh, we look at this verse and we think it says, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask his pastor. Oh, well, uh, that's not bad in its proper order, but it's out of order. Uh, if any of us lacks wisdom, let him ask five of his closest friends. No. If anyone lacks wisdom, let him ask a Bible study group that he goes to. No, that's not what it says. It says, if anyone lacks wisdom, let him ask of God. We have to come to God first for wisdom. And so when people will come to me and uh, say, oh, I, I need uh, wisdom in this part of my life, the first question that I've really been trained to ask is this, have you prayed about this? Have you brought this before the Lord in prayer? And, uh, you know, you'll get people who are kind of like, well, uh, yeah, I mean, so, yeah, well, no, no, you you pray and you, you follow through on this. Let, let him ask of God. Why should we ask God for wisdom? Because he gives to all men liberally and without reproach. Now, the term liberally here has nothing to do with your politics. It just means that God loves to pour out his wisdom. He's generous with his wisdom. You know, I think uh, Chuck Swindoll put it this way one time. Sometimes we come to God asking for wisdom and we think he measures it out in a little eyedropper. But uh, in reality, God's got barrels full of wisdom that he wants to douse upon us uh, from his word. So uh, he gives to all men liberally and without reproach. Now, I love that as well because in God, when you come to the Lord with something where you're clueless, you know, you might run into some mature believers in the Lord who've been walking with the Lord for some time, and you ask them this question, and they kind of roll their eyes and go, oh, I can't believe you don't, you don't know about that. That's, that's being reproached, if you will, for answering a question. And, and you know, unfortunately, we can hang out in Christian circles and see people kind of get shot down or put down or treated condescendingly for asking a question. And we learn uh, an important proverb, better to be silent and be thought a fool than to speak and remove all doubt. The problem with that is if we don't ask questions, we never get answers. You know, and so, uh, you know, this idea of giving to all without reproach God's never going to roll his eyes when you ask him a question. If you come to him and you go, God, I sincerely want to know what you want me to do in this set of circumstances, God will never, ever say, say to you or even come across to you in any way like, oh, come on, you know, I, I mean, you should be able to figure this out all by yourself. God loves to give us guidance. As a father, I know, Sean, if you came to me, and said, you know, I'm facing this big life decision. What do you think, Dad? Um, first of all, I would consider it a compliment that you'd come to me and ask that question. You know, it would communicate to me that you trust me and that you, you value uh, my input. It would warm my heart if you did that. And if you came to me and asked me, you know, just say, well, you know, I've got this financial situation or some specific thing. 
you know, I'm not just going to, you know, shotgun it or say, well, you know, it's kind of what I, I think, you know, if it's a really serious question uh, and I don't immediately know the answer, I'll, I'll say, you know what, Sean, that's such an important question. I think, you know, let me look into it and I'll get back to you. That's the idea of not experiencing reproach. Uh, you know, I try to deal not just with Sean, but my daughter Sarah in such a way that if they have any kind of question they ever want to ask me from my uh, quote unquote years of experience and so on, I'm more than happy to share with them and I'm more than happy they would come to me. So that's the idea of it being without reproach. And, and when we understand that, that uh, there's no rolling of the eyes from God, when we ask him a question, it encourages us to do something else that the Bible tells us. We are told that we are to come boldly before the throne of grace in Hebrews chapter 4. We're going to talk a little bit about that at our uh, midweek oasis service at Calvary Christian Fellowship this week. But the word boldly literally is two Greek words fused together. One is the word to say and the other word is anything. You know, in other words, you can come to God and say anything. Why? Because he already knows what's going on in your heart. You know, uh, was it uh, uh, Brad Stein who has a routine uh, about someone uh, coming to God and say, you know, God, I was thinking. Yeah. And and God goes, God, know what I was thinking? And he goes, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Can't <laughs> but, get a word in edgewise with that guy. <laughs> exactly. He knows. Look out for these bumps. They're everywhere. I know. What? I know. What? You know everything. I know. Stop it. Why? Yeah. I don't know. I do. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So, you know, the fact that we can come to God and God is is just tickled that we're coming to him and that he does have wisdom for us. And notice when we come to him, it will be given to him. Okay, how does God give us wisdom if we come to him with that kind of attitude? Well, as you mentioned, there are people in our lives like pastors who can give us insights by pointing them, interestingly, to his word. You can have Bible study groups that will hopefully be reading his word. And, of course, if you have those close friends in your life that you consider godly examples, they will follow the trend here yeah. point you to his word now obviously if you're going to pull a homer simpson and say i can't find any answers in here you're not looking for it in the right way what we're not being told is here's a here's b here's c god's not a sonogram testing nor is life that way either when we're given the opportunity to practice discernment what we're shown is example after example of the kind of people who in those situations chose to either trust god and plan ahead or consider the immediate gratification and ended up losing. The point being made is this. If you have a consistent and a at least reliable understanding of the message of Scripture, when you're looking at people, say, for example, like Joseph, he's not going to tell you who to vote for next political season, but he is going to tell you that the way things tend to sway in politics can go one way or another, but God is constant. Likewise as well, if you are raised up for a moment or in a moment of time with power and authority, don't waste the opportunity because it could have far-reaching consequences down the road. Yeah. Say for yeah. his family, for yeah. instance. Yeah, and so the example of a guy like Joseph that we find in Genesis 37 and following uh, can give us uh, a way that, that we can deal with things. And we go, oh, but those people lived so long ago. How does that relate to me? Well, one of the, th some great lessons just from the life of Joseph is, first of all, he's the, all, the original, you can't keep God's man down. Uh, talk about uh, if life hands you lemons, make lemonade. It seems like every time he got slapped down, the Lord raised him back up again. Uh, you know, when we think about temptation, great example of uh, Joseph coming face to face with his master Potiphar's wife who wanted to sleep with him. And uh, we see that uh, Joseph, you know, was willing to sustain against that temptation, first of all, because he understood who he was as a believer. You know, he said, how could a man like I do such a thing? How could I be unfaithful to my master and do this sort of thing? In other words, he was faithful to God. He was faithful to his master, and that kept him out of a peck of trouble. Before when, the Ten Commandments, by the way. When, uh, when uh, Potiphar's wife wouldn't take no for an answer, he fled. You know, the New Testament says, flee youthful lusts. Don't uh, make a little uh, encampment for them or, you know, just say, okay, youthful lust, you can... I'm not letting you in here, but you can sleep on the couch. It says, get away from them as quickly as you possibly can. So, you know, in that Old Testament story, we see that example. Personal examples can certainly show us how to walk in God's ways and what the beautiful outcome is of these sort of things. Uh, the other thing that we find in Scripture is there are certain 
precepts or principles we find in the Word of God. Uh, oftentimes, uh, what we uh, we talk about around here, uh, John, is the uh, idea of uh, taking the Proverbs challenge. Uh, if you don't know what to do in a particular set of circumstances or what God specifically wants for you uh, in a, a particular matter, boy, open the book of, pray, open the book of Proverbs and say, Lord, guide me to a principle, uh, a command, an insight that will show me what I need to do. And I guarantee you, you read through the book of Proverbs for more than five minutes, you're going to find uh, a bunch of things that apply to your particular set of circumstances. James has been called uh, the Proverbs of the New Testament. Uh, and so if you read through the book of James, there's all kinds of principles in there and commands and insights uh, that can guide us along the road. The other thing is this, um, you know, there, there's an acrostic that we have put together as far as how to understand and know God's will, G-U-I-D-E. Uh, it comes from Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. And you don't know any other scripture. And I know some people are out there going, well, you know, Scott, you know, you and Sean are, you know, the Bible guys. And, and you know all these verses, but I don't know any verses. And, you know, how in the world am I going to find my way when I just don't know the Bible that well? Well, you don't have to know the Bible that well. You just have to know a few parts of the Bible really well. Uh, and one of them, if you're in a place where you want God's guidance, and who among us doesn't find themselves there more often than not, uh, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Uh, the famous passage, trust in the Lord with all your heart, lean not on your own understanding, in all your ways acknowledge him, and he will make your paths straight. Now notice that's a conditional promise. God will make your paths straight provided you follow through on some principles. And that's where that acrostic G-U-I-D-E comes in. The first step is give the situation over to God. Trust him with it. Uh, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Secondly, lean not on your own understanding. The U in our acrostic stands for understand related verses. As we said, take that Proverbs challenge, read through that, read through the life of Jesus. See if he has anything to say about the circumstance that you're dealing with. Read the letters of the Apostle Paul, especially the back end where you have a lot of uh, insights and, and this is what you do with your faith uh, now that you've got it, uh, kind of uh, wisdom that is found there. But uh, understand related scriptures, because I guarantee you, no temptation or trial has come your way, but such as is common to man, 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 13 says. And God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you're able, but with the temptation or the trial will, allow, will provide the way of escape also that you may endure it. Well, how do we find the way of escape? We find it by understanding related scriptures. The I in our acrostic stands for invest this day in walking with God. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your understanding in all your ways. Uh, in, in other words, there's parts of guiding your life and making these decisions you can be responsible for today. But if you're all freaked out because you don't know where you're going to be five years from now, uh, or you're thinking about a decision about, um, you know, maybe you're a junior in, in, uh, at the U of A and you go, what am I going to do after I graduate? Well, you're not there yet. Uh, you know, you need to be walking with God today. Don't get so caught up in a future that you can't really anticipate that you get your eyes off of just simply cultivating that relationship with God today. And, and that comes to the D in our culture. Dedicate your heart to God. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him. In other words, realize that when God said, I'll never leave you and never forsake you, he meant it without faith, without trusting that God has a purpose and a plan, as we often emphasize around here, uh, you can't please God, Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 6 says. So give your heart to God, understand related scriptures, invest this day in walking with the Lord, deepen your relationship with him, and then the E is expect guidance. He will make your path straight. He will get you where you need to go. So uh, remember that, and we'll put that up uh, on online for you guys if you want that G-U-I-D-E acrostic, and uh, hopefully you can uh, cut and paste and keep that around because, boy, I've just found over the years, I have relied on that and relied on that and relied on that uh, more often than not. And let me tell you, when you're in this uh, pastoral stuff, there's stuff that comes your way and decisions you got to make that uh, they never... <laughs> prepare you for in seminary uh, or, or even your own experience. It's just, uh, it, it's an exercise in walking by faith, 
But as we walk in faith and in the light of God's word, God always gets us where we need to go. All right. A uh, question from Mike that ties into the passage we just read, believe it or not. Uh, wants to know, how do you pray in faith? I always seem to will myself to believe it will happen rather than happening naturally. I'm wondering if this is why I don't see answered prayers. Just to elaborate, I'm going by the verse, he who prays must believe it will happen or something along those lines. Uh, Mike, we actually had a question about it earlier in the broadcast. The passage that you're quoting is James 5 and onward. Uh, when we're talking about the issue, though, remember what James is specifying that you should ask in faith, and then it will basically follow through from there. Let me start in verse 5. If any of you lacks what you want, what you're asking for? Wisdom. You're asking for something specific. You're asking for wisdom. From who? Let him ask of God, who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. Your verse, Mike, verse 6, but let him ask in faith with no doubting. So if it's not doubting, but faith, that means that this would be not doubting, that you won't receive what from God? Wisdom. Wisdom. Verse 5, remember that. So, for he who doubts is like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. For let not that man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. Now, what's the thing that he's not getting any of? Wisdom. Wisdom right. That's what's being asked of. Yeah. He's a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. So, Mike, when you're reading that passage, make sure that you don't read into it more than what's being presented. Verse 5 precedes verse 6. Verse 6 is what you had in mind. But what's another passage that people tend to take out of context is also uh, found believe it or not, from the mouth of Jesus, I believe in the Gospel of John. Anything that you ask in my name, it will be given to you. Well, what's the precondition there? In my name. Which means that you're doing what? I'm praying I'm praying and asking God to give me the wisdom to ask for what Jesus would want in this situation. You're bearing his name, his identity, his nature. You're praying as if you were him. So with faith and in, in the name of Jesus, we tend to, you know, couple those two things with prayer. They're both under the assumption that you know and you trust the one who you're talking to will do right by you, which means that oftentimes, especially if you pray like I do, the answer is either no or wait. He has something better in mind for you, or you're not ready for that yet. When it comes to the random things that come into our mind, or even the important things that we are presenting before God that we need, if he delays, that doesn't mean he's denying. But also note as well, if we're asking the question, we need to make sure we're asking the right question. Because the book of Proverbs actually makes a uh, interesting parable illustrating the two ways that men act, interact with wisdom, what James says in your passage you're praying for, that will either receive you with open arms if you seek her diligently, or it will mock you in your calamity for neglecting her. Now, understand that that's a pretty vivid picture of the way, oh man, if I had only known what I should have known then, but I didn't know now until it was too late. That's the idea of wisdom mocking you, as you realize, I should have done that, but now I did, but I didn't, and now I see exactly where that's gotten me. If on the other hand, you said you prepared for this, and you never even noticed the mistake until you see other people making it, you're like, Wow, thank you. I'm glad yeah. I studied in yeah. advance for this test. Yeah, exactly. That's the idea there, Mike. So when we're asking in faith, we're trusting the one to do right by us. If we're doing it in the name of Jesus, it's the same principle. But remember, James 5 prefaces what you're asking for in faith is wisdom. Not anything you want, but what God wants for you. The ability to make good decisions with the knowledge that you have. Yeah, and uh, one other thing I'd add to this is, you know, sometimes when uh, people will hear an answer like this, as far as, you know, what's God's will for my life? Uh, you know, the, the funny thing I've discovered over time, and I've discovered it in my fallen little sin-shriveled heart as well, is when I'm asking God for wisdom, you know, it's not so much that I'm coming with uh, an open agenda. Uh, I've got a pretty good idea what I'd like to see happen in, our, in a set of circumstances. You know, and, and so when, I, when someone says, you know, well, ask God for wisdom and all of this. There's part of me inside that's like, mm, yeah, that sounds like the right answer, but it sounds a little dull. It sounds like someone tell you to eat your broccoli or, you know, because it's good for you. And, you know, God won't really give you good stuff. He just wants to give you this kind of yucky medicine because, you know, he sees the big picture and just suck it up and hold your nose and a spoonful of sugar makes the medicine go down. Uh, but, you know, the, the thing that people don't understand is this. Wisdom, asking God for wisdom, is the gift that keeps on giving. It's like one of the greatest gifts that God can ever give you personally. 
uh, there, there's, uh, the, you know, the, the, the whole analogy comes down uh, like if, um, like in Aladdin, you find the genie and the genie uh, gives you three wishes, right? And uh, the wise guys, when they hear this story, just say, I'd get to my third wish and I'd say, I want three more wishes and so forth and, and so on. But if uh, God came to you and said, I will answer just one prayer in your life, what would you make it? You know, there was a guy, by the way, in scripture who was given that deal by God. That was the inspiration, by the way, for A Thousand and One Arabian Nights, of which Aladdin was based on, but I digress. But uh, his name was Solomon. And not long after Solomon took the reins, King David had passed away. It was a place called Gibeon. And uh, the Lord appeared to him at night and said to him, ask me for anything you want and I'll give it to you. And Solomon was wise enough at that point just to say, man, I'm a youth, I'm inexperienced, there's no way in and of myself that I can govern your people. One of the first steps towards wisdom is being wise enough to realize you don't got it. And he goes, please give me a, a wise and understanding heart that I might be a shepherd of your people. And God says, because you asked for that, I'm going to give you everything else that you, that you, you didn't asked ask for. for wealth and yeah. you didn't ask for victory over your enemies right. peace for your empire you asked for wisdom so I'll not only give you wisdom but I will give you wealth no king will be greater than you in wealth or prosperity and you will also know peace your entire reign the three wishes and, you know, at that point. and you know what the other thing on top of it all was this God gave him wisdom so there was no one like Solomon that walked in wisdom. We're still talking about the wisdom of Solomon in this day and age. So if you think that asking God for wisdom is kind of like, uh, you know, I got to, you know, um, you know, eat, you know, some, you know, vegetarian substitute for that steak that I really wanted to have because it's going to be better for me. Uh, understand what wisdom brings to your life. Uh, you know, in uh, Proverbs chapter 3, in verse 13, Solomon said this, Happy, supremely happy, is the man who finds wisdom and the man who gains understanding. For her proceeds are better than silver and her gain more than fine gold. She is more precious than rubies and all the things that you desire can't compare with her. Length of days is in her right hand, in her left hand riches and honor. Her ways are ways of pleasantness and all her paths are peace. She is a tree of life to those who take hold of her and happy are all those who retain her. The Lord by wisdom founded the earth. By understanding, he established the heavens. By knowledge, the depths were broken up and the clouds pour forth their dew. My son, do not let them depart before your eyes. Keep sound wisdom and discretion. They will be life to your soul and grace to your neck. Then you will walk safely in your way and your foot will not stumble. When you lie down, you'll not be afraid. Yes, you will lie down and your sleep will be sweet. Do not be afraid of sudden terror nor of trouble from the wicked when it comes, for the Lord will be your confidence and will keep your foot from being caught. Man, you get all of that just by asking for wisdom? I mean, read through that section of Proverbs and personalize it. You know, would you like something that's more valuable than silver or gold or rubies? Would you like to have a, a long life? Uh, would you like to have riches and honor? Would you like to have a life that's filled with pleasantness and peace? Uh, would you like to be happy in this life? Would you like to live in such a way that, uh, that you walk safely in your way, your foot's not going to stumble, and when you lie down, you're, you're going to lie down, your sleep will be sweet. Man, I run into so many people who just say, man, if I could just get a good night's sleep. Well, here you go. One of the pathways to uh, getting that is by learning to walk in the ways of wisdom that come from the Lord. So rather than looking at wisdom as some, you know, kind of uh, consolation prize, apart from the stuff that we really want in life, uh, you know, it's like one of those things when we learn to ask the Lord uh, for uh, his wisdom, uh, you're going to get everything else that you could possibly ever imagine on top of all that. So. Right. Uh, another uh, series of questions, I think we can knock these out pretty straightforwardly. Uh, Yari sent them along. What happened to Pontius Pilate? The short answer, historically, is that we aren't told. There's some church traditions that believe he uh, was, and this is also affirmed by Roman records, but the final result we aren't sure of. He was uh, exiled after he couldn't keep the rebellions out by uh, Emperor Tiberius, I believe, and uh, he ended up basically dying in the Alps in Gaul. That's modern-day France. Now, um, there is a tradition that noted he died 
washing his hands in the snow, saying, I can't get the stain out in reference to uh, his uh, part that he played in the crucifixion, but that's not affirmed by any historian. It was a tradition, so I take it with a hefty grain of salt. But he was deposed from his governorship uh, roughly four years after Jesus' crucifixion for being too heavy-handed, believe it or not. <laughs> the, Ro <laughs> the Romans say you're too tough. The, the people in Rome are like, whoa, dude, you got to... Mixing some decaf, and we're going to get you out of here. We're going to send you into exile. All right, so yeah, that's what happened to Pontius Pilate. Um, where was Daniel when his three friends were thrown in the fiery furnace, and vice versa? Well, his three friends were thrown in the fiery furnace. That's the vice versa, but what about Daniel? Well, I think the vice versa is where were his three friends when he was tossed in the lion's den? Uh, they were probably yeah. in the same principle. They were off doing their own thing. Yeah, well, the, the, the interesting thing is, yeah, you know, there are people who go, whoa, you know, where is Daniel? In the midst of all of this, here you've got Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Uh, you know, you, you recall the account, uh, for those of you not familiar with it, uh, Daniel was used by God in a supernatural way to interpret this dream that this uh, absolute dictator by the name of Nebuchadnezzar, the emperor of the Roman or the Babylonian Empire, had. Uh, and uh, he wanted to find out what the meaning of the dream was. He went to his uh, soothsayers and his uh, spiritual guys. And they said, oh, tell us the dream. We'll tell you the interpretation. He goes, no, no, no. I want to know that you're really giving me the right on interpretation. So you tell me the dream, and then I'll know you can give me the interpretation. And they threw an eight-day fit. No king has ever asked for anything like that. And he says, you guys are all a bunch of spiritual con artists. I'm going to kill you all. Well, Daniel and his friends uh, were in training uh, to be part of this spiritual cabinet, if you will, for Nebuchadnezzar. And uh, they were going to be killed right along with him. And Daniel stopped the guy who was in charge and said, whoa, 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 just give us 24 hours. We're going to pray and uh, we'll tell the king his dream and we'll give the interpretation. So they sought the Lord. God gave Daniel the dream. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar was very impressed. The dream was about a succession of world-dominating empires represented by a huge statue. The head of the statue was gold. God gave Daniel the interpretation. Nebuchadnezzar was the head of gold. Then there would be a chest of silver, a kingdom that would come afterwards that was still something but inferior to Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom. Then there would be a uh, abdomen, lower abdominal area of bronze. That was the Greek empire that would rise afterwards. Then there were two legs of iron which represented the Roman Empire. And then at the bottom of the statue, feet made of iron and clay, the last world-dominating empire that would be made up of a confederation of peoples that wouldn't adhere together but would rule and reign. So Nebuchadnezzar was like, whoa, man, you're right on. Well, lo and behold, Nebuchadnezzar didn't want to uh, have his kingdom pass away. So he made a statue 90 feet tall and 9 feet wide, told everybody to worship it. Well, Daniel's three friends refused to do so. They were tossed into a fiery furnace, and uh, God miraculously delivered them. Where was Daniel? Well, remember, by this time, Daniel was the prime minister, if you will, of Babylon. Very possible that he was off doing the king's business elsewhere. There's a prophetic overtone to all of this in that uh, the Jewish people will go through the fiery trial of the tribulation. God will see them through, but God will keep us out of that tribulation by way of the rapture. God bless you. Have a great rest of your day in the Lord. You've been listening to A Reason for Hope. Thank you again for joining us as we continue our journey through God's Word, one question of the heart at a time. Until we meet again, we would love to connect with you. You can text or email your questions to questionsforhope at gmail.com. You can also find out more about our ministry at calvarychristianfellowship.com. And be sure to join us next time on A Reason for Hope. A Reason for Hope is an outreach ministry of Calvary Christian Fellowship in Tucson, Arizona.